I met Anne Elgood at a conference um, on dance at the Hammer in 2013 and found myself afterwards searching for her words. I've been struck by the tenderness and the care with which she writes about the work towards which she turns her attention, the many interests, sounds, and elements her work is able to hold at the same time. Um, I was fortunate enough to share an evening with Tisa Bryant some weeks ago and did the same searching afterwards um, after hearing her read a piece that mingled imaginings, imagings, memory, and analyses in a way that resisted the distinctions between as if to put forth or begin to unfold another way of storytelling, another way of being near to work. Simon Leung um, has been a worker and a maker I've admired for far longer than the time I've known him. His bravery and candidness around sharing his experience, making space for the experiences of others, and questioning always what experience is and what it can be are all small shades of why he was an essential part of today's plan. So with that. Well, I want to thank Latia for having me. I'm really honored to be here. And I also want to thank Virginia and Ethan and everyone at 356 for organizing today. Um, I just want to say a couple words about what I'm going to do. Um, this is actually timed really well and interestingly for me. I am opening a, a retrospective of Jimmy Durham's work next January at the Hammer, and my catalog text is due on Monday. So you all know exactly how I feel today. Um, I also just returned from spending a week with him in Naples, so it's always extremely generative and exciting and overwhelming and wonderful and crazy when I spend time with him. So there's a lot going on, and when Latia made this invitation, I thought, oh, this is so interesting. I have no idea where I'm going to be with all this. Of course, I thought, oh, I'll have the text written, and I'll just do some readings of excerpts. But as I'm sure most people in the room um, do the same thing, I'm, I'm sure I won't turn it in until the very last second that they rip it from my cold claws. <laughs> so what I'll do today is a, just a very short um, kind of bio on Jimmy because in the process of organizing this exhibition, I've realized that um, many people aren't familiar with him or his work, um, more than I thought in the US, which is in large part because he's refused to show here. So <laughs> there you go. Um, for the last 20 years or so, mostly, he's shown a little bit. Some of you might have seen a couple pieces in a show I did at the Hammer called Take It or Leave It um, a couple of years ago. Um, so, but I'm not gonna get too deep. I mean, some of that will come out, of course, in the talk itself. I am gonna show you a couple images and then I'm just gonna turn it into a, a slideshow. So there'll be images of Jimmy's work just kind of as background. I'm not gonna go into any great detail about individual pieces, um, but at least you'll get to see some things. And keep in mind, it's just such a small fraction of his production since the 1960s. And then the talk itself will consist largely of unedited, you know, just writing I did over the last couple of days for today, and a few excerpts from my catalog, um, also still very, in the early stages, and then I will interrupt myself to include some poems and excerpts of essays by Jimmy, who is a, a very amazing writer. And the quote that I'm showing here, I'll talk about in, in a minute, um, but it is, it's becoming a bit of the heart of the exhibition in some ways. So I'm throwing this up, this is ridiculous, I don't expect you to read it, but just to give you like a snapshot of um, some of the moments in Jimmy's life. And I think as you'll notice in the end, um, once he leaves the US in 1987, first to Cuernavaca, um, Mexico, and then to Europe. In Europe, um, the places we could really call his residence are those listed here, but I would also note that he um, has done innumerable artist residencies and short-lived stays, you know, of a few weeks here and there in many, many other places. And he is notably peripatetic in his life. And, um, and in fact, he would say that he is intentionally homeless. 
So I'm gonna start with a couple of his poems that I think speak to this itinerant quality in his, in his life choices and also just a little bit about his personality and his sense of humor. This first one is, sorry, got a lot going on up here. Um, the Golden West, a poem wherein he sings his yearning for the West. I'm gonna saddle up my pony and ride away out where the west winds blow. I may go out to Alberta, to the Calgary stampede, cut down to Frisco Bay. At the end of the golden day, as the sun sets in the west, then west, then west, sail away on the ill west wind, Manila Bay and Mandalay. I may land in Guangzhou or Ho Chi Minh City, then ride like the wind to Irkutsk or Ulan Bator as the sun westward rests with the west winds before me and the sun's blessed glow. I'm going to ride to Budapest. I'll cut down to Bangalore. Happy, go lucky, and free, that's me. I may have a shot at the West Bank in Palestine. I'll dance in Beirut, then west. And then this is called Song of Myself. Many people, especially the women, a lot of women, call me Dr. Jimmy. References can be easily provided. Let Jimmy take over. I heard that on the radio. Muhammad Ali said he was so tough, he wounded a stone. He made a brick sick, he said. Not me, I fix him up. Most good singers are named Jimmy. Jimmy Cliff, Jimmy Reed, Jimmy Baldwin, Jimmy Rogers, Jimi Hendrix. Me too, I sing, dance, move. Prologue. I met Jimmy Durham 10 years ago when I asked him if he would be interested in working with me to submit a proposal to the State Department to be the American artist to, quote, represent the U.S., a notion we, in fact, planned to deconstruct and call into question in the American Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. I was frankly shocked when he took me up on my offer, and although we worked on a proposal that I feel certain to this day would have been a real contender, in the end, we never submitted it. For various reasons, both personal and political, Jimmy felt unable to proceed. After returning from spending five days with him in Berlin, he wrote to say that as much as he wanted to participate in this particular arena, he knew from experience that the American context, even one located outside the geographical borders of the United States itself, was too difficult and problematic for him to take on this project. So pronounced was his realization that he felt certain the project would be bad for his health were he to continue. Based on our conversations up to that point, I knew exactly what he meant. I didn't understand the nuance of the political situation for him as an unregistered Native American in the politicized cultural context of the US, of the US, nor would I have presumed to have a beat on the monumentally layered composition that made up his life up to that point. But I could hear the pain in what he wrote the uneasy combination of desire and disdain, the slight nausea that accompanies memories and feelings after being awoken from a period of tactical repression and have once again risen the, and, and have once again risen to the surface, the fear of disappointment coupled with the need for self-preservation. The night before, I experienced a pronounced synergy with this man I barely knew. I awoke at 2 a.m. vomiting and continued to be sick throughout the night. When I received his email the following morning, I was not surprised in the least. I wouldn't say I saw it coming. I merely intuited and embodied some small amount of his anxiety. My initial sense of disappointment dissipated quickly as I realized I could do nothing but agree with him. To do otherwise would be not only insensitive, but perhaps irresponsible, perhaps unethical. We would not submit the proposal. Our short-lived working relationship was over, or so I thought. But in that moment, I also experienced a palpable sense that to know Jimmy Durham and to work with him would be much more than an aesthetic and intellectual act of discovery, investigation, and presentation. I understood profoundly, albeit subconsciously, even while I had no idea if we would ever actually work together, that the process of working with Jimmy would also be intensely emotional. I would somehow need to match or at least attempt to reflect the level of dogged commitment Jimmy had made in his own politics and practice over many years. 
To this end, being a stubborn Capricorn and a middle child inherently dispos dispos disposed to acts of negotiation turned out to be my best weapons. I stayed in touch with Jimmy, a voluntary exile. He has not been in the US since the mid-1990s when he moved to Europe. I wrote to him periodically. I would visit him when I was in Berlin or would go to Berlin to see him when I happened to be nearby. I would show up at his exhibitions when I could. During a visit to Brazil, I learned that he was in Rio preparing for an exhibition at a gallery there. And I, although I had already left Rio for Sao Paulo, I returned to Rio to spend a day with him and his partner, Maria Teresa Alves. I basically followed him around. Some might call it stalking. Although being a social animal and a gentleman, rather than getting a restraining order, he would always welcome me into his home and his studio to spend time together. During some of our visits, I would ask him again if he would give me the great honor of working with him, if he would let me organize a retrospective of his work in the US. Each time he would listen as I argued my case, each time he would smile and nod, seemingly pleased by the invitation, and then he would politely decline. There were many times during our eight-year courtship, surely an inappropriate term to use here, that I told myself to stop badgering this poor man. But upon reflection, I would always come back to the simple fact that I felt deeply committed to this work. And that beyond my personal obsession with it, the history of American art had benefited greatly from this artist, even while his role in it was startlingly starting to be, let, to be overlooked in the absence of consistent visibility within its borders. I told myself, and when he would allow me him, that regardless of his decision to reject most invitations to exhibit in the US for many years, this would be an egregious art historical oversight reinforcing the marginalization and masking of practices that did not featly, neatly fit into the mainstream, especially those intentionally critical of those normative practices. Nonetheless, I would tell Jimmy that I would never organize an exhibition of his work without his consent, that part of my desire to organize this show was to work closely with him, and that I respected his decision not to show in the US. I only asked that should he ever feel ready to, quote, come home, so to speak, that he would consider me uh, to curate his US retrospective. During one of our visits and yet another failed attempt to convince him, he looked at me after declining my offer once again and said, ask me again. No doubt he knew I would. Just over two years ago, after visiting him in Berlin, I awoke on a Sunday morning and checked my email and there was a note from Jimmy, which simply read, let's do it. I immediately wrote my director, Annie Philbin, and chief curator, Connie Butler. Annie replied that I should open a bottle of champagne. Fuck yes. <laughs> Number one, be careful what you ask for, curatorial responsibility. Nearly 30 years ago in the pages of Art Forum, Jimmy Durham wrote, I feel fairly sure that I could address the entire world if only I had a place to stand. Jimmy's entire life might best be categorized by his ongoing search for and insistence upon being given a place to stand in order to participate in the discourse. Arguably, he has succeeded in numerous ways. From the outside, it's easy to assume that he would feel a sense of accomplishment in effectively getting his opinions, his ideas, and artworks into the public realm. And of course, I think there are certainly moments of great satisfaction for him. And yet, through conversations with Jimmy, I've come to realize that this is a lifelong struggle, one that will never be resolved, that can never be fully realized, and that in between whatever hurdles he manages to jump is a continual state of feeling, in fact, largely misunderstood. Not in a whiny, entitled way, but almost matter of fact, as if history has engaged in such willful misrepresentation that it, is that it has deemed a figure such as Jimmy nearly indescribable, so alien to some as to be unbelievable. My desire to work with Jimmy is in part an effort to give him one more place to stand along his journey, to put him, quote, at the center of the world, a phrase he has repeatedly used in his work to suggest pushing his way from the margins and out of the shadows and into the center, into visibility, onto a stage where he will be given the microphone. One ongoing dilemma, one that is both endlessly fascinating to me and incredibly anxious making, has been that of negotiating my wish to position Jimmy's practice within the history of American art. To see him and his work as absolutely inextricable from his background 
as not just an American, but a Native American, with the fact that one of the primary reasons Jimmy left the US was that he felt that the context of so-called multiculturalism and so-called identity politics were nothing but a dead end for him, which his work could only, in which his work could only be seen and understood through the lens of his identity, his so-called Indianness. Is it possible to be simultaneously, genuinely, deeply American and resolutely, purposefully transnational? To feel an abiding connection to your place of birth, yet refuse to step foot there? To be an American who, under current political and ecological conditions, can no longer recognize himself as such? To reject the very notion of American identity as it has taken shape over the past five centuries, on the grounds that America has consistently attempted to erase from history one of its primary founding principles, that the genocide of the indigenous people was the necessary collateral damage to creating a civilized country, is to refuse to align oneself with misrepresentation, the rewriting of history, and the continued invisibility and mistreatment, mistreatment of a group of people based on the social construction of race. This is an ethical position. It proposes that the current widely promoted understanding of what it is to be American, based in nationalism, militarism, capitalism, and power mongering, is counterproductive to its expressed ideology of freedom, equality, justice, and community. This position is what we might productively call post-American, and the artist who most fully embodies such a stance in his life and his work is Jimmy Durham. Number two, writer's block. How to find your voice when the subject is a better writer than you will ever be. In a 1990 interview, Craig Owen said he wanted to write, quote, not necessarily about critical and oppositional practices, but alongside them. Like Minha's intention to speak nearby rather than about, Owen's stated position resonates with me in part because Jimmy is himself a truly beautiful writer, one whose cumulative writing practice encompasses poetry, political policy, essays on history and human rights, aesthetic discourse, and institutional critique, curatorial writing on other artists' work, and on and on and on. What is impressive is not only the range of categories of writing to which he has contributed, but that much of his writing exists somewhere between these categories, a combination of them, and moreover, a resistance to them, in keeping with his abiding suspicion and criticism of all forms of categorization and labeling in culture and society. Jimmy's 1993 anthology of writing is titled A Certain Lack of Coherence, after an essay he wrote in 1988. This title provides a glimpse of the elliptical quality of his writing that, it, uh, that his writing often embraces. He is committed to the poetry of prose and the prosaic in poetry, marked by a prioritization of wordplay and an impulse toward punning over rhyming and a favoring of disharmony over familiar cadence. His writing is nonlinear, littered with interruptions, questions about process, direct address to the reader, and unfinished thoughts and sentences. This is a poem from 1983. How am I going to begin? They were walking along. Phyllis Young told me that in the winter of 1984, it got 100 degrees below zero in South Dakota with the wind chill factor. These two girls ran away from the St. Francis Missionary School on the Rosebud Reservation in the winter of 1990. They were walking along, trying to get home. They wanted to go home, and one girl died from the cold. The other girl got frozen feet. So when the missionaries found her, they cut her feet off. Interruption. We interrupt this poem to repeat a story Ruth Reynolds told just last night. She said that when she was growing up in South Dakota, white people used to trade land for Indian, from Indians for an overcoat. When the overcoats wore out, the Indians would come to the landowners for new coats, saying, my overcoat wore out, but the land has not worn out. She also said that in those days, she and the other white folks would hold square dances. That reminds me that in 1923, Eagle Elk was arrested on the Rosebud Reservation for attempting to conduct a Sioux ceremony. Now, back to the girl with no feet. I guess she stayed in school after that. Anyway, the savage and subversive round dances of the Sioux had been outlawed. So that's all I have to say right now. Oh no, it's part two. 
wherein the poet assumes a different voice and self-consciously criticizes his lack of poetics. But first, another interruption. In 1929, two boys escaped St. Francis Missionary School. One died from the cold. What is wrong with these stupid Indians? Why doesn't Mr. Durham use some subtlety or some metaphor? The bare facts do not make a poem. Let's have the two girls walking along chanting. Let's begin with a chant or a description of frost hard as knives. You could have the two boys following the same path in the footsteps of the girl with no more footsteps. You could use the rhyme of walking. This poem stumbles. To try to include Jimmy's writings, his remarkably original and compelling voice in every aspect of this project is an obvious priority. But how do I embrace his consistent rejection of convention in my own writing about his work? How do I value the need for curatorial writing as such for this artist, and I do, and take pleasure in the small factual corrections like a previously misstated work that comes out of intense archival research, and we, know, and we all know how joyful these small victories can feel, and yet firmly position myself within an ethics of resistance to notions of mastery, of even the remote possibility of a complete story told. I am continuously aware that for all I have learned from Jimmy's work, and indeed from the bottomless intellectual and insatiable curiosity of the man himself, there is so much I do not know. Jimmy's writings in all its forms is, are nonetheless devoted to historical fact, to participating in remedial efforts to right past wrongs, in historical accounting, and to make visible that which has been largely obliterated from shared his historical memory. Yet Jimmy is fully aware that histories are also subjective, incomplete, manipulative, emotive, and deeply complex. As Douglas Crimp so, so put it so well in his pictures essay when articulating aspects of postmodernism, we are in search of sources of origins, but the structure of signification, and, I'm sorry, we are not in search of sources or origins, but the structure is of signification. Underneath each picture, there is always another picture. When it comes to writing about art, history, or art history, we might change this to underneath, underneath each history, there is always another history. And I also want to read from an essay of Jimmy's. This is the essay, A Certain Lack of Coherence, written in 1988 on history. I want all of our history. I need every name, every artifact, every effort. I want to know the minute specific of our history because I need to be part of it. But I am part of it. I could not choose otherwise, the way a Jew is part of the Holocaust. In the Cherokee language, the word for the world and the word for history are the same. Our history is, however, too closely tied to yours for the past 350 years. It has become strange, untenable, unbearable, and in unbearable ways, untrue. Our history has become lies within your history. The lies have caused me great suffering from the day I was born, and at least I may, must react to that suffering. You also suffer, suffer from the terrible unreality of a false story badly told, but must live within it, and like the torturer and his family in the evening, at supper, after a day's work, must do your best to continue to pretend that it is all normal. From our position, so much is lost, and being lost, we do not recognize the loss. In one 25-year period, we lost half of our people, not once, but twice. Those who remained were in a state of continuous warfare against you, a war aimed at our destruction. Again, we lost half of our people, and of the remaining, a death here, an early death there, a desperate flight, which required of us every moment of energy and thought. Only imagine half of our doctors, our scientists, our philosophers, our historians, our children, then again and again and again. And in such a war, such a long war, that to laugh or dance or to make something was an inc incredibly arrogant act of resistance. Not dead yet, number three, not dead yet, the fault lines within the very notion of retrospective. I realize that the sometimes unwieldy and yet catalyzing combination of terror and desire, of utter commitment and inevitable self-doubt that I heard in Jimmy's email to me when he stepped away from submitting the proposal for Venice has become my primary state of being throughout this process. I don't mean that to sound more dramatic than it is, 
It's not so much acute, although I admit it infects my dreams most nights, but more of a kind of low-grade burn, stoking the fires of my creative energies while making me cognizant that a, rec that a retrospective is a ridiculous thing indeed. One way Jimmy would deflect my invitation to work together was the argument that he was still alive and producing work, that retrospectives are for the dead. In curatorial practice, there is often a false premise, an ingrained presumption that to stage a retrospective is to tell a comprehensive story of an artist's production. The impossibility of this task is rarely acknowledged. Nonetheless, it is, it is, if one can accept the deeply embedded problematics of the retrospective as a form, I would argue, and of course did, with Jimmy that it is a methodology of exhibition that is for the living. To the contrary, to tell a story with the understanding that there are more stories to tell over time and in dialogue with an artist, is, uh, with an artist as complex, brave, unstoppable, and difficult to encapsulate as Jimmy is as joyful as it is enduringly overwhelming. The responsibility is undoubtedly an honor. There's much, much more to say on all of this, but I'll end with um, two more poems. This is not New Jersey, 1988. Look, cousins, you made the wrong turn. This is not New Jersey. These salt marshes and pine trees understand near neither Gael Gaelic nor, Sass nor Sassanach English. And those Lenny L Lenape your father killed are walking around your closed, scarred suburban houses. So you'd, so you'd better just split. If you want New Jersey, well, I think you've got to tear down old New Jersey and build a new one there. You can't import Jerseys or Yorks or Hampshires or Georgias. Those half-acre wooded lots are not suitable for building. And Mr. Penn does not own that, civil, that sylvan countryside. Why look, you huddled masses are messing up our corn crop and the bean rows we took such care with. Why don't you go huddle in Jersey or Silencia or just ride a passenger pigeon into the sunrise? Why don't you just clear out, drop dead, or at least forget about Jersey, cousin? You're too lost for that. Hey, cousins, even the grass around here hates you. You know that? You don't, why don't you just pack up your golf balls and jump in the gulf? Or at least straighten up. You made the wrong turn. This is not New Jersey. This is not the new world. You need to get your bearings straight. We live here and you are scaring the fish. See, we don't call this place New Mongolia or New Jersey. If you lost New Jersey, why don't you just go home and start out again in a different direction? There are no golden doors here. There's only corn and we planted it. You got nice wheat to eat back in Jersey. Why don't you pack up your Wonder Bread and jump in the ocean? or turn your station wagon around and drive off the scenic overview. Why don't you ask the government to sterilize you? You're so unsanitary, dragging around that load of Jersey bullshit. You are just German germs and Dutch elm disease. Why don't you OD on English tea and jump in the Irish sea? A pack of wolves are going to ride down on you. Our wolves can beat your German shepherds that guard your family treasures, cycle and fence or not. You may think I'm just talking tough, but this is not New Jersey. And then I'll end with a very recent poem called Alternative, Alternate Sayings. Alternate Sayings. The proof is in the peach cobbler. The proof is in the puddle. The proof is on the roof. The truth, the truth will in. The truth will rout. The truth will pout. There's many a slip between the cup and the saucer. There's many a slip between the other clothes and the basket. There's many a slip in the bathtub. What's sauce for the goose is sauce for the duck. What's sauce for the goose is gravy. What's sauce for the goose saws for the moose. Too many cooks spoil the fish. Too many cooks make broth. Too many cooks make stuffing for the gander. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him bathe. You can lead a horse to the barn. You can lead a horse or follow him. You can lead her hosen in water, but you can sardines in oil. Thank you. I've been to the, uh, the Senate House Library in London to do research into these supposedly literate enslaved women on a Barbados plantation. Uh, my mother's family is from Barbados, um, and they immigrated here um, in the 20s um, and gradually um, 
almost the entire family ended up in New York and Boston. Um, so when I heard about these women, um, I was really intrigued um, because I'm really focused on the idea of authoring and authorship and authority um, and our real conceit um, in our culture uh, about literacy, um, mark making as self making, um, meaning making, um, and basically who gets to tell uh, a story and how is that story told. Um, and African diasporic people, uh, African people generally, um, despite you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of records of, of literacy and alphabets and writing get rele relegated to oral tradition. Um, so I always find myself very interested um, in other kinds of uh, literacy um, and storytelling. Um, and some of that is often caught up in image making as well, right, as a way of authoring and, and authorship and authority. Um, and some kind of control over your own um, representation um, and how that can be written about. So, thank you. <laughs> um, I kind of want to start with this gigantic um, piece of penmanship. It's actually the back cover of uh, Ellen Gallagher's um, artist catalog. Um, she's called Ellen Gallagher. She's a visual artist. Um, maybe some of you know her. She's famous for these kind of Sambo paintings and um, some other works with um, ads from uh, wigs and little googly eyes that she puts on them. She does big cut vinyl pieces. Um, and I've known her for a long time. And she always starts her paintings, like the grounds of her paintings begin with this kind of penmanship paper. Um, and it has a connection to her learning how to um, make boats. Um, she apprenticed herself to a boat maker in Northern Europe. Um, but it's also this way of her always beginning the grounds of her paintings with kind of authoring them and remembering kind of going through this rote um, process of, of learning to inscribe herself into the world um, through the promise of literacy. That was what was promised us for our freedom. Um, so I, I like starting with this um, because of this idea about who we are and how we, how we become who we are. And I connect this to the women in Barbados and the idea of their literacy and all of the, the letters that I hope to find in their hand because I was really interested also in handwriting and creolization. Um, it's kind of strange, but it's like, okay, like how do you... How do you become a self on paper? How do you create the shape of your marks? Um, where is that individuality? Um, is there individuality? Because we're taught to make letters in a particular way, um, to be legible and visible. Um, and so um, that um, coupled with the work of um, Fred Wilson, maybe some of you know his work. Um, it, you know, I, I love this image, um, particularly it's from a show um, at the Hood Museum called um, So Much Trouble in the World, Believe It or Not. So he's riffing off of Bob Marley and like Ripley's Believe It or Not. Um, and what he does is he kind of negotiates with these historical museums to kind of go into their permanent collections and remix their collections and recontextualize them. Um, and also kind of show them up for their holdings and what it is that they're valuing. And this museum, um, like many, has a lot of ethnographic busts. And I liked what he did here with this image of having um, some of these ethnographic sculptures reading themselves and looking at themselves um, and comprehending um, the mythology of their existence being made around them um, as if they were not cognizant of it. Um, and it's just kind of like a visual analog um, through visual art, like this work from Jocelyn uh, Gardner, who's a Barbadian, a white Barbadian um, a visual artist. Um, she uh, was imagining the um, how enslaved women on the Egypt plantation in Jamaica did each other's hair. Um, and in imagining this, she is engraving on um, 
on mylar because it's skin-like. And um, so she really wanted to get into the process of writing on a skin-like substance um, and to explore the kind of material um, conditions of life for these ex uh, enslaved women. Um, and I don't know if you know about the Egypt plantation, um, but Thomas Thistlewood, who was the owner of this plantation, was um, notorious for uh, raping all of his, all of this uh, enslaved people on his plantation, men and women, children, um, and the plantation was overrun with um, cases of syphilis. Um, and he kept uh, fastidious notes. It's all chronicled. There, it, it's still in print. You can buy the diaries of Thomas Thistlewood if you are so inclined to horror, um, to read um, detailed accounts of this man's uh, subjection of other people, um, which he felt compelled to record, which I find fascinating. Um, and so all of this kind of lays a ground for some of the archival work that I've been doing and looking at how visual artists dig into archives and what kinds of work they make. Um, as a way of maybe trying to dig out work that hasn't been made yet. So it's a, a strange leap. Um, I didn't say that I'm trying to work on a book about all of these, this archival research. Um, it might be called residual, it might be called abeyance, I'm not sure yet. Um, but it's really about all of the affective leftovers of doing archival research. I spent two months in London digging through 400 years or so of plantation records, trying to find these literate women and a trace of them. Most of it is in accounting ledgers and then a few letters um, requesting manumission um, or help for, from a child. Um, and my chief correspondent was this gentleman um, plantation manager who had his own aspirations of running a plantation himself. And, um, and he kept, he was writing to the absentee landowners. And I didn't expect him to be my correspondent. You know, I expected to somehow be reading about these enslaved women of the Newton plantation, um, Old Doll and her daughters and all of that, and instead I get this guy, Samson Wood, you know, for 30 years. And when he died, I was just like, oh, sh oh shit, you know, I, I didn't expect to even care. I didn't expect to be attached to this person. I you know, was fictionalizing and writing a novel. I didn't expect to be writing from the point of view of this man. Um, and I felt like I didn't have any place to put those feelings um, about being so immersed in um, the history of slavery and having to deal with, as Saidiya Hartman so rightly put, points out in uh, Venus in Two Acts, you know, you have to really still your own hand um, when you're going into archives um, that are part and parcel and born of violence um, to not disturb what you find there, to not re revise what you find there, to not, you know, the impulse is to kind of change um, the, the circumstances for those you find there that you care about. Um, and you cannot and should not do that, even though that's my impulse as a fiction writer. Um, and so that leads to um, other research, because I kind of got out of there and didn't know what to do with it, and uh, started researching Lorraine Hansberry. So this is a little jumpy, because I'm trying to figure out how all of these things fit together. Um, and then maybe I should read instead of talking and showing you something that I'm not ready to show you. Okay. No one knows she is missing. Her energy emanates from an archival crypt in Harlem where she dies a death of aesthetic underdevelopment, of closetedness, of racial gatekeeping over and over and over again too soon. To whom does the depth of her absence belong? Who misses the presence, the kinship, the faces and love of black women besides black women? Where are the loving eyes, desiring gazes, probing stares, and winking smiles of telepathic proportions now? Where were they then? Put them to the lens. Let me see that look. I want it from you, not you, 
her. We all have obsessions with dead black lesbians, don't we? Here's mine. Lorraine Hansberry, playwright, communist, screenwriter, activist, closeted, hot overbite, reportedly solely to solely prefer the beds of southern white debutantes masked in boho splendor in 1950s Greenwich Village. Her husband, her beard, she secretly divorced, long-term lover of her older white female tenant, Dorothy Sakalis, who conveniently came with the building, dead of cancer at age 34. What appears to have died with her is the depth or the myth of the absence of black women from her life. Her desires for black women, for any woman, is deep in the crypt, guarded by an overzealous cerebus of heteronormativity. In the crypt, I desire her. More than that, I am specific and demanding in my hunger that I force into being her hunger. It's her eyes I want, the spirit of them and their secret. Mine is a stubborn obsession. I refuse to believe that she could not, did not, look upon black women with love, lust, perversion, sapphic splendor, whatever. Her place in the history of black lesbian artists preceding Audre Lorde and June Jordan is unresolved. The feeling is she didn't love us publicly, didn't work for us black women, us black lesbians, but she was dying to undo the aesthetic yokes of the movement and tussle those radical liberals who thought and sought to represent us better than we could. To write alongside an archive is to conjure a ghost that sits nearby in profile, whispering, and that's thanks to Latia, a conversation we had. To write alongside someone's papers, for me, is not to become expert, not to provide explanation, but to act as evocation, an echo to a location at the edge of where letters end, but conversation does not cease, continuing somewhere nearby. What am I after? some politics of the past that is our now and our future, not spelunking for adventure, though desire there is that seeking, not for treasure, for profit, but of evidence, unfinished business, things left unsaid that will be after this looking still so, not a rescue of lost souls or even a recuperation, unless recuperation is inherent, an after effect of bringing forward with thought, with touch, some kind of divining, this urge to touch the material, the letters and sketches, the drawings and daily planners, drafts and th stray thoughts. Touching conjures the atmosphere of being alongside, the mind's touch and the hands. In the archival crypt, this evidence festers. And here I should say that I was researching Lorraine Hansberry at the Schomburg um, Center for uh, Black Culture in Harlem, looking for traces of her um, cinematic vision, as um, it seems that there was no such thing as a black woman director in the 50s, and I think that's a lie and just really a condition of a lack of care and stewardship of the work that was made. It, it, it existed, we don't know where it is, and she's it. She's one. In the archival crypt, this evidence festers. Buy a projector, editing equipment, shoot the script for Faces of Black Women on 8 millimeter film, and perhaps talk to the big dogs of American cinema. I don't know this at first. I'm simply flailing in my desire to know that someone back there in the heady, horrible, liberatory cusp of the 1950s and 60s, someone was looking out for black women with a camera. The new wave of our humanity, politically, romantically, problematically captured along with all the others. I need this to be true. Jonas Mikas is here, Cassavetes, Shirley Clark. Jonas Mikas declared that he that he, that the official cinema all over the world is running out of breath. It is morally corrupt, aesthetically obsolete, thematically superficial, temper temperamentally boring, decrying the interference of producers and censors alike. The group here committed itself to a cinema as personal expression and planned new forms of financing, a festival to represent new cinema and a cooperative distribution center. Of all these intentions, only the latter materialized, the filmmakers cooperative seen here in 1962. 
their earliest films all focus on race, on passing, on the black body, sex, interracial relationships as part of a radical aesthetic. Meanwhile, Hansberry is wrestling with white producers and a, and a director over her screenplay of A Raisin in the Sun. Every aspect of a cinematic experience, exterior shots of food deserts, menial labor, creative montage of romance and city life, even characters familial and familiar being together vis-a-vis -vis nicknames were all cut. 40% of the content in all, leaving essentially a film of a play instead of a cinematic experience of a black family in Chicago. Jonas Mikas and Argus Spear Juilliard, the black actress in his film, Guns of the Trees, slammed the film in the Village Voice, April 1962. I emailed Jonas Mikas and asked him if he knew of any black women, any women of color at all, in his midst who wanted to make films. No, he said, I can't think of anyone. But you know who you should ask? I tune him out, entering the crypt. I find this appointment in Hansberry's planner from November 1962, scheduled with Mikas and Miss Juilliard. I like to imagine that the appointment was kept. I like to imagine that they discussed the horrid review of the film, that Hansberry shared her frustrations with the process, aligning herself with the filmmaker's cooperative. I take this blurry photo and I email it to Mikas. Do you remember meeting Hansberry, I ask? What did you talk about? He never responded. I dream up stories of Shirley Clark and Carl Lee having spaghetti and at Hansberry's house that Baldwin drops by, or maybe Langston Hughes, or fine-ass Diana Sands. I tell myself stories about these meetings, that the possibility of a black lesbian filmmaking sensibility was fomenting then in 1962, that her eyes were not just on the movement, but on our movements, black women as intellectual, sensual, sexual beings, and not trapped in the ethnographic. Or to quote Baldwin's book title, I dream of evidence of things not seen. Cerberus growls in the crypt whenever I try to get nearer to the source, the letters containing the juicy bits of her dates with women, perhaps reportage of her cruising in the streets of Harlem and not just the village, perhaps more effusive and naughty expressions beyond the brown skin and flying cheekbones she professed to love. I imagine Hansberry racing the screen and racing death at the same time. Death wins. By 1966, Hansberry was dead a year, and the film La Noire de, and that's more from her journal, actually. And those are scenes from uh, The Cool World by Shirley Clark. And that's more from Cassavetti's Shadows About Passing that they were so expert on. Usman Senben's Black Girl, La Noire de, critiques French colonialism, the French New Wave, and by extension, the New American Cinema, but our lovely heroine apparently had to be sacrificed for that critique to have edge. Forty years later, medicine for melancholy is somewhat, is only somewhat that in its pastiche of Godard. I want their eyes watching another god. I imagine Hansberry racing the screen. I could make a t-shirt, but the lie I want to tell is much too long a story. I imagine Hansberry's doppelganger and black lesbian aesthetic adversary, who she lives and where she lives, but I saw black liberation cinematically differently. My lie is a novel, or simply a long rumination, a wish or a dream, a novel called The Curator that I'm nearly finished with, which I can place, in which I can place everything just so before letting it spin out of control. 
Hansberry deplore, deplored the naturalism of Mikas's and Clark's films. She said, naturalism is its own limitation. It, is sim it simply repeats what is. But realism demands the imposition of a point of view. The artist creating a realistic work shows not only what is, but what is possible, what is part of reality too. And she hated absurdity, the new theater sensation telling the young, gifted, and black to avoid this modality that it had nothing to do with our liberation. Flying African cheekbones, I find the spirit of Hansberry's eyes and the record of this gaze for her. Cerberus be damned, the faces of black women, not only a history of African diasporic women's roles in liberation struggle, but our beauty, our ingenue flavor, moving as modern humans in jobs, in cities, in love, in desperation, in love with each other. I dream her eyes knew this truth, her heart, and that under cover of darkness somewhere in the movement, and as the movement, she let her passions for black women be felt. It's Juanita Williams, Pearl Bailey. You know who that is. Guns of the Trees. It is the story of two young people, one white and gloomy, the other black and life-affirming, both living under the shadow of the atomic bomb in New York City in 1960. This is Jonas Mikas's film. You can't find it anywhere. I think he buried it. The white pair are self-important, suicidal. Suicidal beat girl Frances whining about the world's ugliness and moodily watching the rain. Dower Gregory, Adolphus Mikas, wondering why she killed herself. The entire film unfolds in the aftermath of Frances's suicide or comparing himself to Fidel Castro. The black couple, Ben Carruthers and Argus Juilliard, who later married in life as well as in the movie, are by contrast, children of nature. And these are the women that Hansberry did love and know. Diane Carroll, Pearl Primus, Diana Sands, Cicely Tyson. And so in imagining the kinds of films that Lorraine Hansberry might have made if she lived I was trying to reinsert these missing filmmakers from the 50s um, and to kind of move forward with this idea of how we might go backwards to go forward in authoring our, our stories um, and not take for granted the few who are able to make films or be on television um, and pretty much promote the same myopic kind of um, idea of what it is to be alive in the world. Um, but in the process of being so close to Lorraine Hansberry's stuff, um, and now I'm actually doing research um, into Octavia Butler's papers at the Huntington Library for the Radio Imagination Project, um, it's overwhelming to be um, so close to these women's thought processes, their dreams and desires, their, for me, their handwriting, the kind of daily materiality of their lives, and know that for all the projects that I'm working on, um, especially some of the more critical work, that there's no place um, for me to put um, all that residual effective stuff about longing and desire and grief for people that I wish for these other outcomes that they had lived longer, that they had more time. You know, I never want to go anywhere near this person's archive. Um, but, uh, and I never would, but for these women, um, there's something that I want to draw forward and have us pay attention to because it's clearly so easy um, for people's work to get lost. All it takes is to die um, and have your work left with someone who doesn't appreciate it, doesn't know its value, um, and or doesn't know how to take care of it, even if they do keep it. 
um, especially with film and photographs. Um, so, yeah, I think that's pretty much my messy little presentation about authoring and not authoring and kind of also falling in love with dead people um, and feeling completely inappropriate um, in, you know, I think I'm also, I am concerned about the politics of doing research and being in someone's archive because in some ways I feel like, do we have any business being there at all? Um, and so close to people's personal stuff. Um, uh, and any of you who have done research know, and I'm talking to lots of people, um, especially more scholarly folks and people doing arts catalogs, um, what do you do with the feelings that you have um, about being that close if you have no place to put them, if it's not part of the, you can't publish that as part of the work, where does it go? Do you just absorb it back into your body and, and that's it? Um, or can something else happen? Um, so that's what I'm working on and thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit, and then I'll tell you when it goes on. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, first of all, thanks um, for um, staying <laughs> this late. It's been a really great day, and I want to thank Latia and Ethan and Virginia very much. Um, when Latia asked me to take part in this, I thought a little bit about what um, speaking nearby might mean to me, and I was thinking about how proximity and intimacy um, can be articulated in so many different ways. So I decided that I was going to return to a work that I haven't really thought about in a long time, um, but it's basically an opera. Uh, so I'm thinking about the libretto um, of this opera. So just a tiny bit of background is that um, I, I finally, I've, I've finally uh, got to a stage where I am literally older than everybody else in the room. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> you may dispute that, but it's true. Um, but for someone of my generation, meaning someone who uh, was an artist in the 80s and uh, was a young artist in the 80s, there was a time when you cannot actually think about art or you cannot actually go through a single day without thinking about AIDS, without knowing um, that someone you know has AIDS, without people obsessing over it. And I was actually, uh, I was in, in school in New York at the time in the late 80s, so uh, ACT UP meetings were a part of my life. Um, I, you know, remember the very first time that Judith Butler um, gave a talk at uh, one of the gay and lesbian conferences. Uh, I remember a lot of the demonstrations. So my thinking about AIDS actually came out of that context of AIDS activism and also the very early days of queer theory. Um, I made a work in 1991, 92, um, basically to reflect on this aporia between theory and activism that existed between theory and activism. Uh, and then, like I think most people um, around that time who were exhausted with uh, thinking about this, uh, I didn't go back to it until, I didn't go back to thinking about it until 96, 97 or so, and that was due to the introduction of protease inhibitors, which allowed many people to live much longer than expected. Uh, so that's a little bit of uh, background on this work. Um, you know, I'm also somebody from a generation who thought about the imbricated relationship between uh, radical gay politics and the, the politics of promiscuity um, 
and how that was re how the thinking of that was recalibrated with AIDS. Um, so this is a, a much larger opera project than I than what I'm showing you. Um, in 1998, I got this idea for this opera, and I contacted a friend of mine, Michael Webster, who's a composer in LA, about writing this. And when I moved back to Los Angeles in 2001, um, I was asked to do a solo show at the Santa Monica Museum. And this is uh, basically uh, what we came up with. It was presented in 2002 uh, at the Santa Monica Museum. Uh, what was presented was the third act. The opera actually has three acts. The first act deals with uh, native and introduced plants. It deals with the uh, natural environment, so-called natural environment of, of Griffith Park. The, whole, the opera revolves around or takes place in and around Griffith Park. Um, there's a section called Botany and Rhetoric, which deals with the uh, writings on plants and nature. Uh, there's a section on water having to do with uh, William Mulholland who brought water to LA. Uh, there are songs that deal with native and introduced plants. And it's built around a father and, and two of his kids taking a walk in the park. Um, the second act is built around a woman, her maid, and somebody who lives in the park, a homeless person who lives in the park. Um, and it takes place in a mid-century modern uh, house. So the woman is a Vietnamese immigrant, and she's become quite wealthy. Uh, but part of how she became wealthy has to do with the gentrification of Las Feliz and Silver Lake. Um, so I was thinking also around this time was when sex clubs in, uh, in Silver Lake were beginning to close, beginning to be displaced. Um, I remember I remember a march that we did from, I think, Griffith Park to Sunset Boulevard, um, uh, protesting you know, certain gentrification tendencies. Also, you have to remember that the late 90s was a moment when uh, all throughout the United States, but especially in cities like New York and, and LA, there was this you know, idea of quality of life, which basically meant um, getting rid of all kinds of disruptive behavior like cruising in the park. Okay, so that's a little bit of the background context. So um, what I can offer you today is an excerpt from the third act. It's not all of it, but it's most of it. Um, there are three voices. Uh, there's a younger man who's a tenor, an older man um, who's a baritone, and a countertenor who's a man who's lost his dog um, in the park. Okay, so Ethan, I think we're ready. Dusk is beginning to fall on the side of the mountain. There's still some light. The young man walks past the older man. The older man follows the young man rather briskly. The young man ends up in an enclave where a small tree is somewhat hidden in the shade. As the action begins, the two men navigate around the tree. There's a recitative, which I'm not going to read, but after the recitative, the baritone moves downward. He's sliding himself down the front of the younger man. I'm counting on the days to not change too much, counting on the city, endless spread before me plain of lights to be my bed, a place to rest. That's what they say, you know, California, LA. Eyes on me where only space has known 
Help tick and tether like a ball spin around the radius of me or the goods to be gotten invisible circle and half circle a tree another tree a will to bear a body to coincide I know where I am this is a man folding and unfolding his mass below covering a man is a large thing not just his mouth all of him of the man more than you can hold can't cover the whole man I drove here in a car where hell that's what you do matter in motion that's how it goes you drive yourself you taste your will I am here and this is the man blowing me this is the one for today for tonight do I count or not at what point does it begin all bodies comparable no two faces the same this is the one for today particulars details like the curve of the tree semicircle bent the length of a cock a body between us not mine not his imaginary body color there is no color this is this all points exposed, all points are departure, the radius, what I can see. Measure this man, the texture of hair, the trunk of the body, his arm, his palm, no face, all faces infinite. A dome on the hill to look at the sky. Love moves toward a singular destination, constant. Leave it that way, always the same. If the stars change, you cannot tell. The city collects all the light from day and cradles its own time, its own space. When light goes astray, what does it see? the insides of buildings, the skins of trees. Some things take up the space of shadows, a singular place, willing participant. Wait, what's that sound? Shh, shh. Don't move, don't worry. They won't see us, they'll go away. They don't look this deep inside, they just just don't move. We're okay. We're okay. Sweetie, where are you, sweet? Time to go home. Come on, sweetie. We've got to go. It's getting dark, time to go home, time to go home. Sweetie, sweetie, where did you go? Come here right now, come 
here right now. I mean it, girl. I mean it. Time to go home, sweetie, sweetie, sweetie. Imagine a future, this body, this past. The boy earlier, my furtive smile, but he just walked past as he looked past looked past me. That was this body, also this body, but was that smile its past? The body ten years older, the boy eight years younger, eight years or less, the body here before me. I will be his past, the past of this man. The boy eight years younger, already my past. A man, his arm around me, is he the future? Imagine a future, imagine this body told to remember. Untorque, untether, scope, and tender, told to remember. Not only the beds on which you lay, but also those desires for you that glowed plainly in the eyes. Bodies are told to remember, rounded shapes, round it off, break it down. The scent, the trees, the here and there. Sense of nature, smells of men. 20 minutes ago, the sight of a man in the park, night falling, night falling, night falling, night falling night falling, my life an inch, the boy just walks past, there is no you, a body on a body, this is this, the day forgets, the night remembers, the forest, the forest, the grotto, the grotto, the arena, the arena, the cave, the cave, the labyrinth, the labyrinth, the cliff, the cliff, the beehive, the beehive, the nest, the nest, the outpost, the outpost, the summit, the summit, the observatory, the observatory. Names in a book as if we're family the likes of you, the likes of me. Oh, you should have seen how it was then. You should have seen pools of sun on a hundred men punctuate the side of the mountain. You should have seen, but how would you know? The past was different. I was once as young as you. Imagine a past younger than you. Not like me now, not this body. 1976, 4th of July, Bicentennial. Miguel, the brightest day. You then, a boy from Mexico, first naked male flesh I'd ever touched. Right here, this tree, another tree. How could we have known where a sentence would lead be past? Would draw me, Kel. Things get better, things get worse. I hold this boy. But I see you, a hundred boys are in the dark. But I see you, 
singular destination. We had eight years. Look at this boy, your shoulders, your smile. Only a few left for me here, but not a single day. Days. You gone for ten, you went so fast Like the fire that once tore through these hills Horrible scars, black charred trees You went so fast, you went so fast The night still falls each day this very spot I know you can see I know you can see the greenness grew back the space of a year and so did the men in slow cruising cars like a family eventually but not you Miguel you went so fast. Hospital beds, hospital beds. I draw a circle, I round off numbers. I round off shapes, regrets, amends. The smell of men counts one to ten. Sweetie, where did you go? Where in the world, sweetie? Sweetie, sweetie. Oh, sweetie, have you got yourself entangled in another nest of feral cats? Have you got yourself entangled in another nest of feral cats? Sweetie, 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 sweetie. No, no, not cats. It seems to be a pack of something, a pack of something. Coyotes, all of the beasts, they all sound canine. The other side, the other side, the other side of me there. The man can't hear. Coyotes can live in 48 states, cross highways, bridges. Night steals the day. Where does he go? A, a dog gets walked, a dog cuts loose, sweetie, no, the other way, the other way, he down below, they overhear, the other way, the other way, the gruesome grab of canine teeth, I see them all in one ball, sweetie, 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 do you hear that, do you hear that, no baby, don't worry, just a man calling, sweetie, sweetie, come here right now. Sweetie, sweetie, what a terrible sound. Oh, baby, sweetie, your name, sweetie, your name, name of the dog. Dog must be small, coyotes in packs, sweetie, the city, the night, the stars. Oh, what a terrible sound, sound. Each day turns back a page. This is the last minute, the last second. Sweetie, each dog's year, a man's time seven. You look skyward. I'm fucking you. This is you, you. She could be two, she could be 12. What what should I do? Sweetie, sweetie, sweet. It all acquires a depth of feel inside of you. The depths, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. He can't hear them. He won't find her. He can't save her. She won't get free. Sweetie, come here right now. Time to go home. Come here right now. Get the fuck here. It all acquires a depth of feel inside of you. The depths of you. How soft you are inside, like the sky, the velvet sky. Um, I think I'm going to end here. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>